the hat that I'm actually going to use most in talking today is as the former, I'm happy to say, chair of the cultural issues subgroup of DSM-5 as it comes out in about two uh, weeks after five plus years of work. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the frame in which I want to put the discussion is that uh, as global mental health becomes more and more successful and the mental health project, if you will, reaches wider and wider into communities throughout the world, people who provide this service will encounter more and more differences in the expectations and experiences that people in the world have of mental health problems. They experience the situation a little bit differently from place to place, interpret it differently, expect slightly different or majorly different uh, forms of treatment. And as a result, DSM-5 became a great opportunity for people who wanted to do this kind of work to try to insert into the diagnostic process, DSM is very focused on diagnosis, insert into the diagnostic process a set of tools, a set of ways in which people attempting to translate from what people present, patients if you will present when they get to, uh, to care of any kind, whether it be in their communities or in tertiary centers, translate from that presentation and those expectations of treatment into the kind of treatments and diagnoses that are based on this kind of research. And so as a result, my talk today will focus on these three aspects, the, uh, the, the centrality of the diagnostic process, and by that I mean it generally, rather broadly, the process of detection and treatment negotiation is what I mean here by the diagnostic process, and tools that DSM-5 could provide in terms of helping with that process of uh, cultural translation throughout the world. Um, this is uh, the slide on the centrality of the diagnostic path of the diagnostic evaluation because it encapsulates, it's the opportunity where the mental health worker at any level encounters the person suffering from a mental health problem, the opportunity to encapsulate and summarize everything that came before the moment of the encounter, including everything that people interpreted about their illness, their different levels of impairment, their different barriers and over ways of overcoming barriers, things they've done for themselves, everything that came before is encapsulated there and prepared for everything that comes after, which is all that has to do with negotiating what people expect of treatment. If they actually do not interpret their situation of suffering as one of mental disorder, there's that level of translation that needs to happen when you do the encounter that leads to a diagnosis and treatment planning. So DSM-5 started out, of course it didn't necessarily achieve its promise, but it started out with the idea of providing greater number of tools and a broader approach to diagnosis that includes instruments, uh, dimensional measures, a number of things of which the cultural assessments was one of them and I'm happy to say that the cultural elements of the assessment did get into the manual uh, and is uh, something that can be used from now on. So several ways in which DSM-5 approached this, I'll mention two. The first is by rethinking the process, reframing the concept of so-called culture-bound syndromes which had acquired a very exotic sort of frame in the previous manuals where only a few people in the world were supposed to have these strange ideas. In fact, everybody in the world, us included, has cultural understandings of what's going on in their life in terms of these disorders and problems of living, and those frames are very necessary to include in any kind of assessment process and treatment negotiation process. So one way that the DSM-5 prop uh, uh, problematized, if you will, the concept of culture-bound syndrome was eliminating that concept and substituting it with three different concepts which are presented in the introduction and again later in the manual in terms of different levels of ways in which people think about their problems. I won't go through them in detail given the time, but it was a way of framing them either as general languages of suffering, so not particularly tied to symptoms, to, to specific symptoms, syndromes that encapsulated syndrome, uh, uh, symptoms that were seen as running together. It has these three components that you see, including the role of cultural identity. This is where you get a lot of information on migration, discrimination, etc. What is it about your being from your particular background? And we ask them what the main aspects of their background are for them. What is it about you being from that particular background that contributes either positively or negatively to solving or getting in the way of addressing your problem? 
The third domain is what is it that you do to make yourself better and what is it that you've tried to do in the past and what to seek help and what barriers have gotten in the way of you obtaining help. And the last domain is what is it that you think you should, we should do from now on, the preferences for care. Now we did a field trial in which David and Dete participated in 12 cities in six countries, assessing the feasibility, acceptability, and perceived clinical utility of this. These are the domain, the cities, you can see Kenya right there, where we did the cultural formulation interview field trial. And the results, I won't belabor them, basically patients liked it better than doctors, which I am happy to report. <laughs> um, this is also because we had an earlier version that they helped refine and we now have a they turn from a 14 item to a 16 item version. We used everything they said to improve it. I won't go through this. So in conclusion, then, um, uh, I hope I have convinced you a little bit that information on this kind of information may help address these aspects of diagnosis, treatment, engagement, clarify apparent comorbidity, at least of the possibility of it, since I only had 10 minutes, and that systematic <laughs> Systematic cultural assessment can elicit in a person-centered ways people's ways of understanding what is going on and what they think ought to be done about it. Thank you very much.